I'm Mark W. Gura. I'm the Vice President of the Atheist Alliance of America. I'm going to ask each panelist uh, to introduce themselves and, uh, and then th give their, their, their opinion on, on, on the topic that we're going to talk about today. But the way that, that this topic started is uh, some of us in our um, activist activities um, noticed that we were getting into clashes online and, and even offline with fellow atheists. So it, it turns out that, that there are, you know, you know, most of us kind of, kind of look at religion in one of two different ways. We either kind of accept, even though we're atheists, we kind of accept religion as being somewhat good um, and, and, and the people that, that, that do that, sometimes they're called diplomatic atheists. Uh, that's what they like to call themselves. Um, and, and, uh, and, and then the, the other type of atheist, a lot of times, sees religion as not having very much value. So the question is, uh, is, this, is this starting to divide our movement a little bit? And, should, and, and rather than ignoring this question and, and ignoring that this is happening, we're talking about it. You know, we want to we, we want to put it out there, and we want you, the audience, to kind of help in this decision as to what to do next. So, so at the end, we, we really want your feedback. Um, we're going to have about twelve minutes of, of questions at the end. We really want your feedback on what you thought. You know, based on what you've heard and stuff like that, or just what you've thought beforehand. Um, so, I'm going to just um, and the the other thing that I want to add is is that these two groups within our movement. Um, I, I, th I, think, I think really the, the core point is, is that the dipl diplomatic atheists tend to see um, religion as having value. Okay, so keep that in mind as everyone talks. And the, the anti-theists tend to see religion as, as not having value, but, but even more than that is corrupting our, our society. Um, because what religion tends to do is it tends to ex explain its beliefs not as as a, as, a, as, a, as a suggestion or a guess or a hypothesis, but more as a fact. So, so anti-theists tend to see that as, as not being honest. And, uh, and so, so anti-theists feel that, that if we don't say something, if we don't criticize religion, we're basically giving religion a pass, where it's almost as if we're endorsing the fact that that's happening. Um, so I would love to hear everyone's point of view now. And, uh, and we'll start uh, with Jason. All right, so I'm doing introduction and my opening statement? Uh, yeah, your opening okay. statement and your introduction. Great, so my name's Jason Brocious. My day job is a CPA, I'm from Pennsylvania. And I do a little bit of this activism on the side for the secular movement. I'm the vice president of Lehigh Valley Humanists and I'm also serve on the board of the Pennsylvania Free Thought Organizers, which is the group that organizes Posticon not a Posticon, but the Pennsylvania State Atheist Humanist Conference. And a little story to start off, I met Aaron there last year, and we had a service project at the end of the conference. And Aaron and I stood across from each other on the same team and packed meals for hungry people in central Pennsylvania. We raised, I think, over $7,000 to pack over 30,000 meals. Um, that's one of the best things, thank you. That's one of the, the best things that came from that conference, and I think one of the best things that came out of this conference when I was downstairs earlier, did, did anybody here give blood today? Yeah, give her a round of applause. I saw another hand in the back. There were a ton of people giving blood downstairs. And uh, guess what, religious people do that too, and sometimes their religion motivates them to do that. And we can get into the specifics of that in a little bit. but. Um, one of the things we did was invite religious people to participate with us at that meal packing project and also to give donations and that kind of thing. And I don't have any statistics of how many people took part. Um, but I will say this, the person who was the main coordinator from the charity Ending Hunger Northeast uh, that was there representing them and sort of running the show was a Lutheran minister. And uh, everybody sort of got a chuckle out of that when he was introduced. and he stood up and said, I love you atheists. And I thought that was fantastic. But um, I'm not here to say anyone's brand of activism is wrong. I think there's times and places for firebrand activism. I thought Dan's talk just before this was very good. I'm um, looking forward to Mandisa's later and I really respect all the people we have here on this panel and the work that they do. Uh, and Dave Silverman, 
makes a compelling case for firebrand atheism, but he also says there's room for other types as well. Because at the end of the day, atheism isn't an end for me, it's a means. Great, you're an atheist, that's wonderful. I'm one too, we have that in common, but that and a dollar gets us a bag of chips. So what do we do to build on that? And Dale McGowan, who had been the director of the Foundation Beyond Belief, uh, said atheism is the first step and hum humanism is the thousand that follow. And that's a more important label for me. I do use both uh, because I do think we need to normalize uh, the first term atheism and get people to understand what humanism the second one is. But there are values that humanism brings to the table. And uh, in, in addition to just rational problem solving and skepticism, things like ethics and social justice, and I hear a lot of crit criticism, especially online, saying you're trying to make atheism something more than it is. It's simply the belief that there are no gods or no belief that there are gods, and that's correct. But I think there's more to be done. Now I'm gonna give a, a kind of a negative example here. I had a college professor who said, you learn a lot about yourself by looking at the people that you don't care for or that you don't share values with. And there's two people that are very close to me and I'm not gonna name names or, or how they're tied to me, but they're important people in my life and uh, I definitely don't share their values. Um, there's quite a lot of misogyny, racism. Uh, they'd put the Tea Party to shame, no offense if, if you're a conservative, I'm not here to argue with them, but I'm, I am here to tell you my values are a little bit different than that. And they're also theists. Now, if I could strip some of those away one by one, I'd leave theism for last. And you might say, well, theism is the cause of all that and the crux of all that. And sometimes that's the case. But in these particular cases, it isn't. If I stripped away their theism, they'd still be the people they are. I'm, I'm a singer, and I used to sing uh, an aria from the creation when I was a religious person. And the recitative starts in, God created man in his own image. But all atheists know that atheists create God in his own image or her own image. And um, that's where their theism comes into play. It just emboldens them in what they do, but it's not at the core of why they believe what they believe. I'd rather work with people like Jimmy Carter to house the homeless, an interfaith soup kitchen to feed the hungry, people like Reverend Barry W. Lynn, who's the director of the Americans for Church and State, to work on issues of secularism, and a particular Muslim that a lot of you know, Malala, who does a lot of work to rail against terrorism in this world, won the Nobel Peace Prize for that. Uh, I'd much rather work hand in hand with a lot of those people than some of the atheists I've come across in the YouTube comment section. Uh, <laughs> if any of you are them, shame on you. Um, so who brought me out of it? It wasn't an atheist. The person who started and was the biggest influence on my atheism was a bishop. And it wasn't from a negative example. It wasn't a horrible bishop and I said, I don't want to be like him. It was Bishop John Shelby Spong of the Episcopal Church, um, who very much believes in the mission of the church without, without all the mythology. And rather than seeing all churches close and those organizations' resources go to waste, that's what I'd like to see the church evolve into. Um, we shouldn't treat Christianity, I'm gonna, I'm gonna single in on that because that's what I know. We shouldn't treat it as one religion. When you say Christians say X, Christians do Y, Christians think Z, you're making a fallacy of a generalization. If you say all atheists have in common is their non-belief, that's true, but I think Christians even have a lower common denominator, and that's simply a cast of characters in a library of books known as the Bible. It has nothing to do with Jesus' divinity or atonement salvation. They don't all agree with that. So hopefully I'll have some more comments later, but I think I'm getting the stare down, so I'm gonna pass it on. <laughs> okay, uh, my name is Neil Carter, and uh, thank you. Uh, I'm filling in, uh, Kyle Jones wasn't able to make it today, so I appreciate y'all letting me uh, jump in here. Hi, Neil, didn't hey. see you sneaking hey, in Aaron. behind me. I kinda snuck in. <laughs> and, um, anyway, I write a blog called Godless and Dixie, and thank you. Um, and, and I would fall into the diplomat, uh, binary of, uh, of this, this panel. And oh, so what do I do? I teach school. Um, I teach math in Jackson, Mississippi. And um, I do not teach with my 
usual name because I'm too easy to Google. So I've decided to go by a different name when I teach my first name. So hopefully they won't find this for at least another year until I can make them like me because um, I've had some bad experiences. Which kind of leads to my, my position in this is that uh, I live in the Deep South and in the Deep South your approach uh, is going to be different than it will be elsewhere. So the first thing I would want to say, and I'll try to make this quick, is if I look at today's brochure, the description reads this way. A discussion between firebrand atheists, that would be, what, that side? And... Well, starting with me, I think. Yeah, somewhere <laughs> around. And uh, diplomatic atheists, in qu quotes, diplomatic atheists, who think it's a bad idea to challenge religion. Okay, stop. No, that's not true, and I'll talk about that in a second. Is it advisable to keep a low profile and go along to get along with religion as, quote, diplomatic atheists suggest, or is there more to be gained by openly challenging religion? Now, this may have just meant to kind of stir interest, which is, which is you know, fine. But I challenge religion all the time as a, as a diplomat. I'm definitely a diplomat. I, I like to go into churches whenever I can and talk to Christians if they'll let me. And uh, in fact, my foray into the atheist movement was to uh, join with Kyle on the uh, interview an atheist at church day. And, um, and I got to talk with a pastor in front of his church in Jackson, Mississippi. And I gave a, a few points about how I feel mis uh, that Christians misunderstand atheists. And then I let them ask me questions. And it was a great time. It was rare to get a pastor that would let you do that in Jackson, Mississippi, by the way. But um, I had more people message me over the last three or four years, three years, about that one talk than anything else that I've done since then. Because one guy wrote me a few months later and said, I had been trying to broach the subject of my atheism with my family, my very religious family, for years. And I couldn't find the right opening. But then the video showed a Christian pastor and an atheist talking in a congenial, conversational manner without calling each other names, without insulting each other, or saying the other one was dumb for believing what they believed. And I was able to show that to my family and it opened up discussion. Um, and it was specifically not a debate by design, which was fine. And this is the part where I'll stop and say, to me, diplomacy and uh, confrontation are both tools they're not so much two totally different paths as, as much as they're two totally different tools that you will use for different situations at different times. Every firebrand here is going to have a congenial conversation with a person of, of opposite belief, and it'll be constructive at some point, probably frequently. I'm pretty sure I've seen at least a couple of you do that. And I will turn around and criticize religion as well, which I do frequently on the blog, and sometimes even in person. I just tend to kind of use one more than the other. So to me, it's more like there are two different tools to be used at different times, and certainly more often in certain places than others. So like, for example, I think in Jackson, Mississippi, the firebrand approach will not sell well. Because take, for example, um, American Atheists trying to put billboards in Jackson. They tried to do it last year when they had the, um, the Atheism Conference in Memphis, and it wouldn't fly. They couldn't find any place that would let them do it. All right, I'm out of time, so I'll be quiet. What's our time limit? <laughs> Uh, Less than it, what I just make did. It make, it, <laughs> make it brief. Okay, well, see, I, I, one of the things about, when you talk about uh, people that, uh, that adopt a religion, you know, whenever they tell you that they've, they've accepted Christ or whatever, and I've, I've heard the same story when they've accepted Buddha or, uh, you know, when they've adopted Islam or what have you, the stories are very often very similar. Right when when you come into religion, very often the excuses that I hear are kind of the same theme. You know, well I changed lives. You know, I used to be a crack addict or whatever. But when people come away from religion, the reasons are incredibly different, and I can't predict what they would be. And for and for everybody that I've ever talked to, and I love to get deconversion stories. I mean, the, the stories are so wild. I mean, what the key thing, the thing that put the chink in the armor from which everything else began to fall apart was something that I couldn't predict. And sometimes it's based on a scientific fact. Sometimes it's based on the hypocrisy of the church or something that they read in the Bible. And it's never the same fact for everybody. So there are multiple approaches that I think are necessary. Now, I am diplomatic only in the, in the sense that I am a reasonable, rational, intelligent person, right? I am a firebrand because it is a fact that religion is a net negative with nothing positive to contribute to humanity. And I won't, I, I won't endorse religion. When people want to be humanitarian, 
I will encourage their being humanitarian as long as their religious belief isn't ex an excuse for why they're doing that. You know, I, I would rather that we all work in a humanitarian cause as humans. Um, and I, I think I'll just I'll sit back on there and say that we we need. We, but there are better speakers than me. There are more compelling people than me. And there are people that deserve to be heard, but can't be because they need a bulldog to clear the way. And that, I feel, is my job. I'm, I'm Rob Penzak. I'm executive director of Atheist Alliance. I think Arne, everybody probably knows, is our president. I think he left the introduction off, but he probably is well known. Um, <laughs> So th this is a little difficult. We don't necessarily want to set this up as a debate, but we do want a very honest conversation. And it's important that we understand exactly where people on the other side are coming from. Um, we've all expressed that there are a range of techniques that are important. One thing we have to make sure is that people on one side don't shut the other side down. I don't think you'll find any firebrand atheist, depending how you divide, um, design it, saying you shouldn't have civil conversations. That's one of the main things you know, we're working on street response. We want to have these productive collaborations. I do think that there may be some people on the other side that say, hey, you're too much in their face. You just raised the point about the uh, American atheist billboard in certain places just won't fly. I would argue that might be the exact place that we need more firebrands to put that there. One, so that people that are non-believers in places where it's just rife with belief, they see that there's somebody fighting for them. Um, you know, and I guess I, I'm going to let John introduce himself. We do want to like sort of keep time so we can actually have a good conversation. But I, I wouldn't just let that pass and assume if it's hard to get real in-your-face stuff done in a certain area that we should back off. Um, I, <clears throat> uh, my name's John Loftus. I'm a writer of books. <laughs> That's what I'm known for, and I'm a board member of uh, Atheist Alliance of America. And uh, you know, I'm finding from the discussion on the other side there that uh, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot I agree with. I mean, uh, if I were Neil, I would probably use his approach. You see, um, uh, quit quite a bit because I didn't want to get stoned. You know, I don't want to get stoned. I think that's a bad thing. I don't want to get burned at the stake either. That's that's bad as well. And I don't want to get fired if I was a teacher. So I would do that as well. Uh, so I'm not asking him to be me. I, uh, I wrote a book, uh, I, I edited a book called Christianity is Not Great. It's really thick about the evils of uh, Christianity, witch hunts, uh, slavery, uh, how that some parents let their kids die because they have faith and don't take them to the hospitals, um, that uh, they deny climate change, uh, Christians were against science, Christians were against um, uh, democracy, and yet they turn around and claim that they were for it. They, they are uh, anti-women, as far as I'm concerned. Um, they are um, um, anti-life, uh, anti um, and, I, and um, um, uh, lots of different things, you know. And um, now, th not all Christians are that way, okay? Uh, granted, granted, granted. And it's not bad to, like, uh, be friends with them. I, my, all, my, almost all my family are Christians, you know, except my daughter. I got one. <laughs> um, and uh, so I know what it's like to be a diplomat. I know what it's not like not to argue, but there are certain times to do that, and I don't think uh, they would deny that. I, I do think that you have to have all approaches, and what we mean by all approaches is that you need a John Loftus. <laughs> you need an Aaron Ra. You, you, you need a Neil. Uh, you know, you just need everybody, but don't tell me what I should do. do you do understand that. Don't tell me how I should conduct business. What, am I going to make you embarrassed or something because I like the billboards? Uh, especially since I see so much, uh, you know, coming from Christians, you know. Uh, top of the list is that faith is unreliable as a, as a mechanism for gaining truth about the world. And so because of that, faith allows them to deny uh, climate change. Now, that's not necessarily helping in a food kitchen, which I would do, but someone's got to tell them that, the, you know, they're stupid <laughs> for denying science. Someone's got to tell them, hey, you're stupid for denying evolution. Someone's got to do that. Someone's got to do that. I will do that. <laughs> Can, can I follow up on can I follow up on one other point that was raised earlier? Is um, you know on, on the left side here, you mentioned that humanism is really what drives you all those uh, ethical issues, and I completely agree. My whole reason for activism isn't because I care that somebody believes in a different god; it's the ramifications of that and the social policies that follow. 
if you enter, and, and I think you also said that, you're an atheist and a humanist. And I don't know how you guys introduce yourself, but if you just say, you know, I'm a humanist, as D Dave Silverman points out, 90% of people don't really know what that entails. If you always say, I'm a humanist and an atheist, I think that's the honest way to go. And maybe you guys both do that. But I think it's important that we're visible and accurate with what we are. Um, you know, it helps other people come out. Yeah, I'd like to just add, throw something else on that because in the, in the last half dozen presentations that I've done in different places that I speak, I've brought up that I am not just an atheist, but I am also a skeptic and I am also a humanist because I have, you know, when you, you, when you talk about social justice concerns, right, there are things that I want to do. I'm not trying to change atheism, I'm trying to change the world and there are some things that need to be addressed. And as far as uh, atheism and skepticism, I mean, I know atheists who believe in homeopathy. You know, just because you're atheist doesn't mean you're an intellectual, it doesn't mean you're learned, it doesn't mean you're skeptical. It, you know, and I want to be associated with all what I consider the best aspects of humanity, and so I want to advertise those different labels that apply to me. I still use atheist because I'm part of the Atheist Out program. I think it's a little disturbing that when 3.1% of Americans identify as atheist, 4% identify as agnostic when you know they're atheist too. And then 15.8% identify as not religious and say that religion is not important. Well, they're atheist too. So if they all said that they were atheists, we would be a quarter of the country. There are more atheists in this country than there are Catholics, and I wish it would, I wish, I, it's time for us to recognize that and stand up and announce it. I'm sorry, that's not what we were coming to talk about, but I'm gonna say that. <laughs> so I'm gonna, I'm gonna paint a, a picture, and I'd like us all to talk about this. Um, let's talk about the elephant in the room. Okay, religion has pretty much the majority of the political power in this country. Religious people, religion. Religion has pretty much the, the majority of the social power in this country. Um, and, and so basically, if we, if we don't, and, and, the, and the, way, the way it has this power is it has this power because it's convinced people that what it's selling is a fact. And that's not true. That, that is a lie. What, what religion teaches is not facts. It, it teaches a claim that it doesn't really back up because there is no proof that the supernatural exists. It's worse than that. You're talking about people that are basically saying, when they're, what the, one, the things that they want to teach in school are no different than teaching that Columbus discovered Ohio in 1942 and that Benjamin Franklin was the first king of America. Yeah, you have the right to be wrong, but you are wrong, and we have the right to be right. And the point is, is if you let someone, a religious leader, someone who's in a power position, who's teaching kids, who's indoctrinating kids, if you stand by and do not say anything, it's like you're endorsing it. So, so basically what firebrand means at its core is it means I tell the truth. Now, there, there is, there's a time and a place. You don't necessarily need to tell the truth at a funeral. You know? <laughs> I mean, you know, there's a time and a place to, 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 to say, but, but you know, we can't, if we continue to allow religion to get away with lying, it's going to continue to breed and indoctrinate more religious people. So, so by, by, by not challenging religion and by being diplomatic, we're endorsing, you know, we're, we're helping religion, I think. Okay, of but course, this is where I interrupt and say that it is not correct to say that the diplomat, diplomat does not challenge religion. Because using myself as an example, I am somebody who doesn't pick fights and doesn't, for example, think that it'll work to try to put a, an incendiary billboard in Jackson, Mississippi, I think it would actually have a backfire effect, personally, uh, the opposite effect of what's desired. But at the same time, I spend a lot of time critiquing specific beliefs within a religion, which means uh, I'm basically just being more precise in my critique. Rather than lumping all religion together and making a sweep, sweeping statement about the effect negative or positive of all religion, I have to say, wait a minute, which religion? There's so many different kinds. I mean, even Christianity can be subdivided into so many different kinds that the moment you begin critiquing one of them, 12 other versions say, that's nothing like me. And so it's like you're coming, you know, you know the old saying, to, the, to, to a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? Well, I think what's happening here is that, again, back to my tool illustration, I think there are different tools for different purposes. And sometimes what's needed is a screwdriver, not a hammer. It's going to make more problems than it 
then it solves. Well, the problem is diplomatic atheists tend to say, don't use firebrand atheism. It's not good for our cause. This is really what we're addressing here. I think the people on this side say, let's use all the tools in our belt. But diplomatic atheists are infamous for saying, let's not be firebrands. Firebrand atheism is not good for the movement. But Mark, I think you're making a dichotomy here when there's more of a spectrum. Uh, and I know Greta Christina, who's an author I really adore in her latest book, um, uh, the Way of the Heathen, I think it's called. It's a great book. And there's a chapter dedicated to this. And she basically creates three camps, uh, the firebrands, the diplomats, and the accommodationists. And I think you're talking probably a little bit more about the accommodationists than you are the diplomats. So unfortunately, I don't think we have one here, but I think they represent the minority viewpoint in our movement. So if firebrand means telling the truth, <laughs> saying it like it is, then are, are you guys in the firebrand Isn't category? Isn't that I mean, wait, okay, tell me the bit? difference between, between uh, you know, a, a diplomat and, and an accommodationist. Then. I don't think anybody in this room, regardless of what their, what their aspect is, I mean, nobody's going to think that they're telling it's like, it, like it's not. You know, everybody thinks that they're telling it like it is. <laughs> you know? well, well, when you're being, di people, people who are diplomatic sometimes will, will basically not challenge a lie that's being indoctrinated to a child. Because that person who's proliferating that lie uh, is maybe a friend or a coworker, and, and, and they won't challenge that person. So that's what I'm talking about. Okay. Telling it like, I mean, I'm using David Silverman's definition. Yeah, right. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm guilty of, of the, you know, the understanding when not to bring up that argument. I mean, I was in the airport in Atlanta, you know, this elderly couple, you know, talking to me about Jesus, you know, and these people are in their 80s, right? What am I going to, what am I going to say to a little old lady, right? right? right. It, it, you, uh, there is no God and you're an ape. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and to build on that, Arn, I, I have uh, two recent examples of a uh, little bit of speaking that I did. Uh, the first rule of public speaking is know your audience. So one thing I recently did was I spoke at Lehigh University for their student, international student orientation. We talked about religious pluralism. And my point in being there was not as much to criticize the beliefs of others, but to de defend the beliefs of atheism. And I didn't pull any punches. And I had to bite my tongue a little bit because it could have got heated. Um, there was an imam there. There weren't any other conservative clergy, but um, I want to be invited back so I could do that again and represent atheism again. And I think if I took an angry approach, I, I wouldn't have that. Now, I wasn't, I don't think I was being accommodationist other than maybe not shouting someone down. But the other example I'll give is I recently spoke at a Lutheran retirement community uh, and the population, I thought it was going to be independent living, active seniors. No, it was mostly nursing home crowd. And uh, again, just like at a funeral, where you'd probably see some of the same people, uh, I don't think that would be the time or the place to um, talk about the faith they've lived all their lives being a lie. Uh, that didn't mean I lied about it. You know, I talked about two things that day. Um, why I didn't believe in God, and again, in defense of atheism as a rational f philosophy, and I wasn't winning over many hearts and minds with that. But the second point I wanted to get across was we may have more things in common than you realize. Um, and I talked about, you know, growing up and watching Mr. Rogers and in times of uh, struggle, where are the helpers and these kind of things. And I found common ground with them. And that's when I started to see some tears well up. And if they could take one thing home from that, if I accomplished one thing, which would be to maybe get them to look at their children or their grandchildren differently if those grandchildren aren't believers and to have a little bit of more compassion for them. That was a win uh, for, athe for atheism and for activism that day. Um, thank you. And the real interesting thing about that is it was a panel just like this. There were six people. Four of them were clergy. One of them was me. I thought I was going to be outnumbered. Uh, they turned out all to be progressive. And the whole reason they had the panel, which was on the exist simply the existence of God, was that there were a handful of residents in that nursing home that identified as secular humanists, and they didn't feel like they fit in. And they wanted to someone to come and talk about it and have some civil discourse and rational discussion. And the people who cared enough to set up that program were religious people. 
and their activism from being the clergy people that they were wasn't to try to convince those secular humanist residents in their 80s and maybe even over 90 years old that they were wrong. Uh, they wanted to say, yes, you're a human being with independent thoughts, you have dignity, you have people in your corner, and we can talk about it. It just seems to me that, that religious leaders, what, what they put forth is, is the idea that the supernatural exists and they put it forth as a fact. And if we, and if we just keep reminding, um, and, and, I, and I see the, the religious people more as victims of, of that lie, because it's, it's, a lie, it's a lie because what, what, they're, what they're putting out is not a fact. So, so by calling that out, I, I think that's the fundamental thing that, that a firebrand does. And there is a time and a place for it, for sure. But we should never not do that. And we should never do away with that tool, I think, is the point that, that, that this side's trying to make. Not, 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 all, not all speech is meant to convince. Um, not, not everything you say should be to convince. Sometimes you need to incite. Sometimes, like Dawkins, you need to just tell it like it is. Uh, now, um, you might uh, choose the wrong venue to do that. Like you wouldn't want to do it during uh, an exercise in street epistemology because apparently you know, that's not the goal. The goal is to convince. And so when you're trying to convince and you're in a venue where you're trying to convince, uh, then yeah, sure, you, uh, you should be nice, you know, even if you're not. <laughs> but, but if it comes to a billboard where you uh, in plan to incite, um, what, what you're doing is you're motivating people who already agree with you, with those billboards. And there's nothing wrong with that. Some people uh, live most of their lives undercover, like you. They never get to get, you know, stand out or never get to speak up. And these billboards speak up for them. And um, some of them are motivated to come out of the closet because of that. OK, I can do that. So the more we get to come out of the closet, the more it works. Because the more that co people come out of the closet, then the more people are aware that there are atheists living next door. Yeah, if I may, I'd like to mention something about my priorities on this. As I, as I told you, when I'm talking to somebody in their 80s and they have absolutely no background for anything that I would want, to, they're, they're not ready for that conversation. I'm not going to have that conversation with them. But with kids, that's, that's another matter. right? Now, somehow, we are considered the rude ones for telling the truth to kids. And when other people tell demonstrable lies to kids, well, then they're, they're the good guys somehow. And I would like to turn that around. I mean, the, the best and worst thing that I did at this last Reason Rally was I got into an argument with this couple, and I, I pointed out there was absolutely no truth in their belief system. I was really hard on them to the point that they both shut down. They both did this. And they were just off. And then there was a little girl, like four years old, handing out a DVD, standing right next to them. And I said, what's on the DVD? And she goes, it's Jesus. Yeah. And I said, well, thank you, but I only, tell you, I only accept things that are true. And she goes, this is truth. And I said, if you can't show that it's true, then it's not truth. And she started crying. <laughs> now, yeah, call me villainous. <laughs> <laughs> I think I did a good thing there. <laughs> yeah. Well, and to Arn's point, look, you know, let's pretend for a second that, that we're, we're religion, right? What does religion want atheists to do? It wants atheists to shut up. It wants atheists to, it wants to become friends with atheists so we don't challenge it, so religion can keep enjoying its power, its privilege, politically, socially, and everything else. So, so when, we, when we don't challenge religious leaders, I'm not saying challenge everyone that you see and, you know, but we, we need to challenge those religious leaders. We, we need to let the population, we need to remind the population that these religious leaders are selling lies. And when we're talking about religious leaders, let's also go into politicians who are using religion to their end. Yeah. I mean, it, isn't that interesting? We, we consider a politician to be a good politician if they say, oh, I believe in, in some supernatural thing that I can't prove. I mean, it's almost like that should disqualify a person from, from being, you know, <laughs> put up for politics, yeah. right? I mean, these, these people are, are, are per perpetuators of lies. And by not challenging them, and I'm talking about challenging religious leaders now. Can, can I add that, you know, so with diplomacy, one of the things that we risk is that you're being a diplomat toward religion. You know, we, we all understand that religious people might be nice and kind, and most of our friends probably happen to be religious, but, you know, Daryl Ray talks about it in, in The God Virus. You know, we, we don't suddenly want to um, let something that, you know, is, is preying on people's brains and causing them to, to think things that are going to damage themselves and damage other people 
we're not doing the individual a favor by giving religion the free pass. All of us probably agree that faith is a terrible epistemic system. It doesn't help you understand the world in a productive manner. So, you know, if, if you can help people think more clearly, even if it's uncomfortable for them in the moment, if he teaches a four-year-old to think, that girl may have 80 years or 90 years of a life that they don't get to the end and look back and say, like John does, I wasted a lot of my years believing really silly things. Well, I think actually what happened was you taught a four-year-old to be scared of atheists. Okay, well, just, I, I to, just to defend that statement, I was the only person I knew who knew what evolution was, much less accepted it, until I was 14 years old. When I finally encountered a teacher who laughed in my face when I, when I, when I sensed something about w during the time of Noah's flood. And he laughed and he said, there was never any flood. I needed somebody to say, there was never a damn flood. And, and you know what? Th that episode that Arn described, when, when a person who's indoctrinated all of a sudden has that moment, you've just broken through. You've just, you, you've, just, you've just broken through that indoctrination. Okay. And that's, now, why, that's why that reaction so occurred. Let me, let me, that let me, reaction occurred because all of a sudden there was a shift. Okay, so um, <laughs> this... Here it comes. <laughs> Give it to me, brother. This, uh, the, well, you know, it turns out it's actually four against two, which I was surprised to see. Um, well, if he set it up. If, 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 if Kyle was here, you know, we, we wanted still to have... would be four against two. <laughs> well, you know what? No matter what moderator you get, they're, they're going to have their opinion. You're a well. moderator? <laughs> <laughs> Touche, <laughs> <Yeah, so, laughs> Neil. Yeah, I've, I've sat through such moderations before. Um, okay, so this, this political election season has been really illuminating, I think, or should be for a number of people, and that is that if you take someone who is very convinced of their belief system, especially if it happens to be very closed off, epistemically closed off, much like the right wing has come to be politically, uh, and I know there are exceptions, but as far as the information streams that the right wing politically in the United States have gotten, it's gotten very closed off and sequestered and, uh, and insular. If you try to break through, what ends up happening, and I know studies have shown this too, is that when you directly challenge deeply held beliefs, they usually dig in even harder rather than bending, rather than opening up to new possibilities. Now, you are an exception. That happened differently for you. And there are exceptions. Some people respond well to the in-your-face in your face confrontation. Um, I, not all people do. And I think certain environments aren't ideal for that. But I will say that for, for most people, I think that the more deeply held the belief is, the further they clinch down on it when you directly address it in a way, especially if it's very closely tied to their identity in a core manner, much like a person's religion is. If you come at it from a slightly different angle, if you have more precise tools rather than a hammer, I think you're going to get a little bit farther in conversation with them. Here's the thing. You know, what religion tends to do... On a one-to-one -to -one basis, I think you're probably right. On a one-to-one -one basis, if you're talking one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two or one -on or four-on-two, I, I think you have a, a, better, a better basis for, for, for doing exactly what you said. But when you're a, a public speaker or if you're writing a blog or if you're writing some books, um, you, you're, you're talking to broad audiences audiences. You're talking to people who uh, already agree with, with you, and you're talking to people who uh, you, you're trying to convince at the same time, but you just can't help but uh, once in a while letting out a ridiculous kind of a comment that might la make your side laugh a bit at the other side, you know. So you're right on the one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, you're absolutely right. They will, they will hunker down. They will, they will bear it down uh, if you start to uh, uh, abuse them or ridicule them. Why does it affect masses differently? Well, you're, you're, uh, it's because sometimes you're not out to convince. Sometimes you're, you're, when you're writing a whole book about something, you're not just simply out to convince the other side. You're, you're, you're meant to educate your side so that your side can help you convince the other side. That's what I do. I, I, I would also say that if you're, sorry, if, if you're writing to the masses, like if you're out there in the mass and somebody says something that really challenges you, is very provocative that you can't stand, you're in a much safer position and you're not going to, necessarily be quite as defensive in that moment because nobody's looking over your shoulder as you read the book and you actually do have the luxury of thinking it through even if it bothered you. So I think it is different when you're not in that immediate situation. If you're, if you're on a panel and you're watching or having a debate, 
very few people on the panel will convince each other in that moment with an audience watching. But I think books and blogs and all those just, other... Just think of Bill Maurer or, or George Carlin. I mean, are you opposed to, to their humor? I mean, surely you laugh. I mean, surely you get some value out of that. And surely the laughter does have a persuasive uh, effect on uh, people who may uh, originally disagree with, with their views. Well, not when I was a religious person. To me, it's more like preaching to the choir. I think the humor appeals to people who are already on your side. Which is, an, which, which is a value in and of itself, though. Sure, right? it can be. But, but if what you say you're doing is appealing to the opposite side, now you've just kind of split your purposes. And you're really well, doing it, the opposite. It, the, more, the more a belief is ridiculed, for instance, uh, the more you, you feel marginalized. And I, I swear, we're not as rational as we think we are. And persuasion does count. I mean, we, we actually can persuade people to a different viewpoint by ridicule. If, if all we ever do is ridicule a particular belief, and that this one lone person in the crowd, we know, in fact, they will change their mind and, uh, and adopt the majority. It, it, it depends on the person you're talking to. They have to be ready to have that conversation, and they have to have some concern over what's really true. I mean, when I went, met my wife online, she was an old earth creationist. Now, I convinced her of evolution, but I used the wrong technique because I used the abrupt accusatory tone and it turns out that she held her position for honest reasons. It was to her sincerity is the reason that she no longer believes. My, my caustic nature did nothing to improve that. But I've gotten, I've gotten hundreds, I'm not kidding about this, I've gotten hundreds of emails from people over the years that said that, you know, that they started out as a believer and they initially hated me but have eventually come to change their minds. And I've even been in debates with people that, that, that have told me that, you know, that they had already stopped believing when they were still arguing with me. They were just arguing because that's all they knew how to do. And then it took them a year or so to realize that they didn't believe then. And they're, they're now a year later going to admit it to me now. But wh why, don't, why don't we use the same diplomatic tact with, with things that we, we know are bad, bad, like the society knows is bad, you know, like for example, racism and stuff like that. I mean, do, you know, would you defend that to, to be diplomatic in, in that situation too when, when we know, um, you know, certain things are really, really bad? Well, I would call that a really poor analogy because again, we're lumping all religion no. into one single pile like racism, one single pile. I wouldn't address them that way. Well, religion has, has one commonality. It believes in, in the supernatural. Every religion, in order to be a religion, must believe in the supernatural. Otherwise, it's not a religion. Well, I think there's a more important aspect of it than that. There's faith. And, and I think that faith is the most dishonest position it is possible to have. And any belief that requires faith should be rejected for that reason. And that is, you know, that's all religious positions. So if well, my feeling is, and I, this is just to, to lay this out there, is I, th I think there's a lot of tribalism to who we are. And, um, and I, think, I think in tribalism, there's a tendency to, once you have a label for the other people that are on the other team, you ascribe as many negative things as possible to that other team. When in reality, the chances are, this is the problem with tribalism, many times your tribe has some of the same problems, which means that religion isn't actually the problem. It's, it's actually problems within human nature that we're still working on, that it would be nice to have some cooperation from some of the religious people should we find a way to, to gain some allies. I want to agree with you and, and also in, endorse, uh, I, I, I forgot the name, at, yeah, at the, at the end there, uh, what you were talking about, social justice, for example, and the people in the YouTube comment sections. And, um, there, is, there is this aspect of trying to do the other, Thing, right, and generalizing everybody. And I, I brought up many times on stage that so many of the most outspoken activists we have are like yourself. They were former believers. You know, they were Dan Barker, they were Matt Dillahunty, they were people that really believed, they were people that were really skilled and, and learned, and then they just found something that changed their mind. So when you change somebody's mind, you might be talking to the next Dan Barker or Matt Dillahunty. You know, so you don't generalize them in that way. And then, as I said before, just because you're atheist doesn't mean you're a skeptical, rational, decent human, or humanist sort of a person. You, but there are some dicks out there. <laughs> right, well, but of course that doesn't mean that, that every approach to get the next Dan Barker, there he is, by the way, uh, is necessarily <laughs> going to be productive because, I don't know, was it a firebrand atheist that changed your mind? No, he's shaking his head. Okay, so well, that doesn't mean you're yeah. right. <laughs> yeah, it does. Yeah. So, so, so let done. me give That's let done. me give one. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to give one counter example, just since we're throwing out Android. So Sarah Hader is one of the co-founders of Ex-Muslims of North America, who does incredibly courageous work. She's pointed out, you know, publicly, she came around because of somebody like Arn, who was in her face, and she didn't like it at the time. It was challenging. She went and she read her books because she can prove them wrong, and she stumbled on the truth. And so. 
everything that she's doing with that comes about because we use a diversity of approaches, and for some people, that in your face, an aggressive approach is helpful. And no, nobody's denying the other side, that the diplomatic way also can work. I don't know, I'm hearing some denial. <laughs> I'm hearing a little bit of, yeah, diplomats are kind of useless. I mean, I'm hearing well, that. No, I, I'm more against so? the accommodationist, I think. I think I, I've agreed with almost everything that you guys have okay. said. Uh, so, I mean, maybe the accommodationist is, a, is the problem that I have. That, and I think we need a different moderator. When I was in college, uh, one of the things they talked about was how movements have a, a fairly predictable structure um, and, and time frame to them, where the early days of almost any movement have to be uh, more incendiary by nature. There have to be ground clears, like you said. There have to be the ones that, that mow down the territory so that somebody else can come along and build on top of that. I think what we're saying that is agreeing with each other is that there are places for both. There are places for the deconstructors who come in and tear down as much as they can. But there's also a place for the ones who come along afterwards and say, so now what? What is it after that? After we've said we don't think there's any gods, now what? Are there things that we do agree on that we can build on? Because we have more problems than just whether or not we think that gods are real things. And we shouldn't wait until we're done tearing down religions to start doing that work. They're both going to be happening at the same time. Well, yeah, very well. So, so, so I, th I, think, I think we all agree. I think we all agree that, that we should use all the tools. And, and that's, that's a happy surprise for me. Because I, I thought you guys were going to say, don't ever be firebrands. No, because that's what Kyle's told I'm me. I'm saying I mean, it won't it, work it, in Jackson, Mississippi. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm serious. You know, Let's try uh, it. You know, well, there's I, a, I live in Atlanta. You know, we, <laughs> really, we ridicule people who um, believe in uh, trolls and fairies, just like we do with people. They don't exist anymore. People who believed in uh, Odin and Thor and Zeus. Right? I mean, we, we ridicule them. We have no, we have no respect for them. We, there we are don't... still Asatru and Hellenists I out there. I know. <laughs> Not, I, okay, you're already fine. But, but John makes a but, point. But um, we, we, we have gravitated to, you know, we have no respect for them. It's okay to ridicule them. It's okay to be offensive. We could put up billboards, uh, you know, against them and nobody would, you know, blink an eye. Uh, so so what's, ha what's happening, what we're, what we're probably seeing is, is that um, America is going through uh, you know, birth pangs, if you will. I mean, the atheism is gaining a stronghold and, and those of us uh, who see it want to run with it, and those of uh, those of you who live in Nashville, um, you know, hesitate. I mean, that's you know, but eventually, I think atheism will win more and more of the day, and we will we'll ridicule it more and more. And we're just on that forefront. We're just doing that sort of thing. Well, I, I have the arguments too. I, I write, you know, a lot of good arguments too. And I, it's just that uh, I also recognize that that's where it's going, and and I want to help propel it forward by that. Also, can I just ask if the premise was that we're done with the ground clearing? Because I would still say we have a major need for a lot of firebrands, too. No, I don't think that we're done with ground clearing. But um, I think that anybody who's going to clear ground is going to take care about what kind of ground they're working on at that moment. So this is back to the different tools for different things. And I mean, for some politicians sensitivity. now. Do what? Politicians. for politicians yeah. now. I, I, personally, I have some doubts about whether or not atheism as a label in and of itself will be enough to put together a significant voting block, personally. Because I think a lot of people who do lack belief in gods don't particularly feel compelled to embrace that label because they're just disinterested in the question, if that makes Those sense. Those are actually my favorite atheists, the ones who don't give a damn. You know, they, they, yeah, but they, what, are they going to vote for the non-theistic candidate yeah. if they don't give a damn? Well, yeah, they would. But, but the, the problem is, is that we don't have any, any like, uh, uh, lobbyists or anything pursuing our interests because, as I said, we, we represent at least a quarter of the country if people would admit that, you know, what their atheism yeah. is. And probably more than that because I've met people who identify as Hindu or Jewish or Methodist even though they don't believe in their scripture and they admit they don't believe in a God. I think We're a probably a third good. of the country if we just people just knew what atheism meant. I think the numbers are just getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, as far as an actual study is concerned, I've seen single digits. That's what I explained to you at the beginning of this. I know. Only 3.1 identify as atheists. The rest of them describe themselves as atheists but won't use the word. But you know better than they do what they are. Yes, I know better than Neil deGrasse Tyson what he is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, gotta, we gotta stop for questions. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> thanks, thanks for moderating. Um, You're welcome. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, so to summarize, I mean, I'm happy to hear that I think we agree on, on the two major points, that, that we should use all the tools in our belt and that we shouldn't be accommodationists because that helps religion. It helps religion. So with that, let's, um, let's, let's get questions and comments from the, uh, from the audience. Please uh, stand up to the mic. Um, 
I need to know what an accommodation is for. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm sorry for being a bad moderator. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Tim. Uh, yeah, so in my personal opinion, I've always thought that the Venn diagram of diplomatic and firebrand atheists really is more of a circle anyways, which is what I heard a lot of tonight. Maybe one thing we should think about is how well we take criticism from each other in the atheist community. Like, for example, Neil raised the point of the backfire effect, and maybe some firebrand atheists aren't really cognizant that that's a thing. Uh, how can we communicate to them that maybe right now what you are doing is triggering a backfire effect that is going to give you the opposite result that you're seeking? Some of my friends in the atheism movement have no qualms about criticizing my approach. And so uh, taking that to heart, I'm actually going to do a video where somebody in a, in a live video stream teaches me, uh, uh, what was street it, epistemology. street epistemology, to make me more effective. Because all I do is, is ram horns. And that's it, pretty much it. And, and keep in mind, you know, indoctrination is, is so interwound with the ego and psychology. So when, when it's challenged, yeah, people have an, a negative reaction initially. But sometimes some of it seeps through if, if it's said enough. And, and, if, and if that person reflects on it enough, please go ahead. Uh, so when I was 19, my, I began my journey from Lutheranism over into skepticism and atheist belief, uh, in large part due to your videos, Aaron and Matt Dillahunty. So just... Mm. Uh, <laughs> they were the biggest on YouTube, so just a personal thank you for all the thankless work that you put in at that time 10 years ago was when I first uh, started seeing that. Um, my one question is, uh, I've seen a lot of success with people I've talked to with analogous comparisons um, to what we all now consider as mythologies, uh, the Greek mythologies, the Roman mythologies, and always asking people, so what did the people of the time think of those religions, the, the mythologies? They didn't think of them as a mythology, they thought of them as a religion, and I've seen a lot of people kind of have a weird little moment in their brain, it's like, hmm, uh, so have any of you had that type of conversation uh, to any success, or have you tried that approach? <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, my, I've tried that once before, and what I found was that they were like, well, no, but mine's different. I mean, because mine's real. Right. End of discussion. You know, mine's special. And that, but that's my experience. So. Please go ahead. Okay, so um, I'll keep it brief for everybody else. Um, do you think that perhaps the tension that is eased between fiber and atheism, and by the way, my name is Anthony, um, do you think that the tension can be eased as far as the approach between fiber and atheism and perhaps a softer approach, in, so to speak, do you think that can be eased by simply asking what do you believe and why do you believe it and then letting go rather than simply charging in and saying, oh, this is a lie because... So you're saying a moderator should ask questions instead I mean, of make statements? I mean, I mean, <laughs> you know, you know I, don't, I, don't, I, don't Perhaps. Think, I don't think firebrand atheism means you have to be rude. Uh, you know, street epistemology, I would consider a firebrand approach as well, and it's very, um, you know, soft and, and non-confrontive. I think what, uh, what firebrand atheism means, per David Silverman's definition of, of his book in it, is that it's just, you know, calling people out. Go ahead. Okay, so I want to go back to the old lady and difficult people in the Deep South to bringing up the subject. What would be your first tool that you would go to somebody that is just so hard-headed they don't even want to have this conversation? What would be like your first topic that you would go to to talk to them about it? I pick tangential issues. I try to pick something that's more of a minor issue that there might be some fudging on. Uh, particularly something that there might be other Christians or other people from the same religion who believe differently from them. And I use more of a wedge approach 
which is I try to find something that I know there are other people that use the same label they do but believe differently on and try to show them, look, some people in your camp think differently about this. And I might not call it your camp at the time, but I might say, well, you know, so-and-so thinks this and then have them discuss that. And to me, sometimes when they rethink this issue here, it kind of leads to others that are closer to the center. And, and there may be more fertile ground to start with than the 80-year-old woman in Mississippi. So you could kind of look at that from a more of a 50,000-foot view and maybe say, oh, there's probably some younger people I should talk to maybe be more effective in in the long run, but and YouTube's the best way to do that, by the way. What, one on one on one, I don't think there's any dispute about some of the, how uh, we would re respond to that. Um, the, the question might be uh, uh, posed by asking how do you uh, figure you're going to um, mobilize the masses, the masses of atheists, whether it's single digit or not, it depends on how you define them. I think there's closer to 20% if you, if you add in the agnostics and the, non, the nuns, but that's whether you can add them in or not, and I don't know whether you can, but um, the firebrand type, the, the, the billboard poster type, um, the Bill Maurer type, the Richard Dawkins type is to mobilize the masses. And I think that uh, with Dawkins and uh, Harris and Hitchens, they did that. They, they mobilized a lot of atheists, you know, and we've mucked it up <laughs> afterward. Uh, but um, they, that's, there's, there's different goals going on here. One is to convince and one is to incite or to mobilize. And um, so long as they're in agreement with uh, the idea of we can mobilize with ins insightful language, then um, there's no there's no disagreement. There probably never was. And, and just real quick, I would say that firebrand means challenging. So in your approach, you're using firebrand techniques too. You're doing it subtly. And subtle firebrand, subtle firebrand techniques are still a challenge. They're still firebrand techniques. Sure. Go ahead. I, I, I guess my question would be. Um, you, you talk about Jackson, Mississippi not being the place where to, to approach it confrontational, but I, I would think those are the places you need to confront it the most confrontational, where it's needed the most. I mean, states like Mississippi, some of their reproductive laws are crazy, and that's driven by religion largely. So why wouldn't you want to go where it's needed the most and say, no, this is crazy, and, and be more insightful? And to kind of speak in the point where you said, you know, does he know, you, you mentioned you know Tyson better than he knows himself. Well, I, I spent like 10 years not knowing I was an atheist because of fear. I didn't want to identify. I knew I didn't believe, but I didn't want to identify. And it took caustic people like, you know, uh, you know, scathing atheist and, and you know, cognitive, just stuff like that to go, no, not saying it is dangerous because when you're hiding it, you're becoming, you're, you're not being vocal and it's harmful. It's very harmful. Well, quick question for you. Uh, where do you live? Where'd you grow up? I grew up in the north. I live 45 minutes from here. And this panel, I'm going to, and I don't like to use the word out because it's, I don't think it's fair. There's a lot of other things. But after this panel, I'm going to out myself as an atheist. And I haven't for years because I live in the south. And I don't want, my, my family doesn't deserve the ramifications of my belief. But yet, if I don't, then I'm fostering those beliefs. And, and that's not right either. Right. Uh, just my short answer is that um, I, I I won't build a long argument for it, except that I know that it's kind of like if you grow up in an area and you know the dialect better than people that are not from that area and you can kind of sense the differences. Um, my experience is that the confrontational approach just doesn't go over well. You get the backfire effect in a place like Jackson. And, and I'll remind, firebrand atheism isn't just the confrontational approach that, that's, that's aggressive and nasty. It can be a subtle confrontational approach, but as long as it's there, as long as you're confronting a lie and you're just not accommodating it. Okay, and, and in terms of diplomacy, are all of the scientists, the vast majority of you know the high, higher uh, educated ones, who are atheists, are they being diplomatic and helpful by not coming out clearly as we're atheists, this is silly, we need to address our real problems in a, um, you know, a, a way that addresses the real world? You know, is that diplomatic or is that harmful? Because I would you know, say that's, that's harmful. That's the accommodationist thing. When, when the scientists are hesitant to make a bold statement that you know, creationism is flat out not true, you know, and, and, and evolution is a real fact. Right. You know, they, so they, they need to be really overt about it. Right, so is that a con would you guys classify that as accommodationist because they're not being honest? Because that now you're going to label is no, is that? I'm wondering if it's a null set. You're saying there, there are a significant number of scientists who don't admit that they know that creation who don't, is. That the public is largely unaware because scientists purposefully don't make it their business to go out and be less they, diplomatic. They're they quiet say about things it. like, you know, that, that, that science can't make any statement about God, and they, and they allow that to extend over to creationism. 
when they need to say. Well, that's them not doing their job. Yeah, well, that, that that, yeah but that, there is a lot of them not doing that job. Right. But, but just calling out the God question, if you're, say, a biologist, is not necessarily your job either. But that's not what I'm saying. Okay. I'm saying they're right. extending that to the pseudoscience that would of be creationism problem. and climate change denial. Right, that would be a problem. I'm a native Mississippian. I think your approach is right. Um, I, I, would, I would do exactly that. Um, I'm a diplomatic atheist, and your assumption, uh, your assumption that we find value in a religion I find offensive, I think you're confusing stupidity and civility. Well, uh, and, and, and I, I, think, I think firebrands can be diplomatic. Let's not, it's not, I'm not saying don't be diplomatic. That's, that's a name that, that, um, that this group kind of coined, you know, the diplomatic atheist thing. But yeah, well, that it's just a label. Firebrands. But, but, yeah, but, but you, you, you made an assumption at the beginning. I'm just saying I think that's false. And you said that, you know, you encouraged everybody to give blood. I think that's great. But always couch that in some people can't give blood. Oh, sure. Sure. Thank you. Uh, I think you guys haven't really talked about the difference in personalities. I think atheists run the full range. Some yeah. of us are confronters. Yeah, some exactly. of us are yeah. diplomatic. Exactly. I think we all just need to speak out and do that in every way that we can. Yeah. And I think some and of us are... firebrand. Yeah. Some of us are built, are built no, with better tool not. set to do one or the other. Yes, right. yes. And so use all tools. That's the point, right? That we all agree on. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank right you. On. This is a kind of a question with activism within our own own circles. I've, one of the things I've been bothered by is um, the rise of kind of the alt-right within atheist and skeptic circles over the past couple of years, and how do I work with, deal with that type of atheist skeptic? And also, I couldn't help but notice that demographics of the panel in the room are a little different. None of you guys are female. Most All of you guys white are white. Guys. So right. those two kind uh, of intersect. So I didn't okay. set up this panel. I know. Neither did I. All right. With, with that, we're very sorry we can't take any more questions. Thank you.